What's up, everybody? My name is Anthony Irvin. You beat yourself? Yeah. Yeah, see me myself. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh. I'm Jim Green. <laughs> Don't even need a hit of <laughs> traffic light. <laughs> okay, good. Club of two. One set. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another brand new episode of the One Set Podcast. My name is Anthony Irvin. And I'm here with my co-host and best friend, Jim Green. How you doing, buddy? I am doing fantastical, brother. Um, fantastical. Yeah. What? Um, <laughs> Yippee. <laughs> yeah, just um, lots of stuff going on, obviously. Uh, and not obviously. I just, in my world of work, yeah. um, it's this month specifically is normally like either really busy or not really busy or a little bit of both. Um, For me, it was like last week I I was mostly busy, but in like weird times of the day, just because like kids are still off of school. So there are still lessons happening. Um, So as far as the Olympics, which we're not going to talk, too too at length about um Mm -hmm. we're just going to cover like the things that we have seen um and there are a lot of like weird shenanigan type things that happened um especially in the gymnastics scoring with the medals moving around kind of thing i don't know if anthony caught all that stuff i'm not Um, sure but we'll definitely talk about it yeah i mean i We'll talk about it. We'll wait. We'll wait until we get to the Olympic chat for it. Um, So I think I like I am at the point now where I am just ready for my schedule to get back to like the normalcy. Yeah, I've never seen like your summer schedule like so busy before because I'm usually I'm I'm usually used to you having like the summer off a little bit and like the the downtime a little bit and then as fall comes then it just starts uh boosting up for you but it's cool to see like now it's almost like year round for you that you you have a little bit of breaks here and there throughout the year but like your summers have started getting a lot more busier which is cool yeah it really just depends on which studios that i'm working for um and how early that they start their next season set of right uh like how far ahead of the game are they going into the season um, and at this point I've worked for over a dozen studios. So it's, I mean, five and six years ago, I was in a, a different County, a different state, like every day, every other day, um, in August and August was always just like, okay, I'm going here. I'm going here. I'm going here. Yeah. And it, it, it was, it's amazing for me to reflect back on that and think that, I at like most of the time didn't have to check my calendar to see, okay, where am I going next? Like I just like knew in my mind, okay, it's like, I, I, I just had that. Um, I'm not that spread out this year, which it, which is good. I'm, I'm still uh, a little bit busy, but right now it's more, uh, I'm more in like prep status Mm -hmm. because um the the projects that i'll be working on i'm not in the deep of it yet like as far as like okay production's already begun for everything which there have been uh there have been august 16th like halfway through august uh in previous years where i've been like up to my ears with stuff um Mm -hmm. but that was in like the past like i said five to six years, 10 years ago, let me think 2014, especially 15 years ago, I would have like such a light summer schedule that I would just be off for like four, five, six weeks at a time. Right. And that's what I was so used to. Like uh, within those three months of summer, like you were just off. And uh, then like definitely within the most recent, like, like five five to ten years 
you slowly started gaining, you know, more and more work throughout the summer. So it's cool to see the progression of like, okay, you're picking up more work and picking up more work, especially in those. Yeah. And I mean, uh, yeah, 15 years ago, I was like, we had just opened up my one studio and we had not a lot of students. So we would do recital and we would have a two week break after the recital. And then we would do a four, maybe six week summer session. And then the kids would be off until September. Yeah. So for like the entire month of August, for sure, if not the last week or two of July into August, um, I wasn't off off. Like we were doing a lot of like admin behind the scenes stuff, but as far as like being in the studio and teaching classes and dancing, um, not really. I mean, like, yeah, because the point blank crew, we hadn't formed until. Yeah. 2009 or 10. So espe- right. especially 08, our first year that we started, it was like, we had our first year. We did the recital took a couple weeks, did a small summer session. And then it was just like prep stuff for the new season. But like, I was definitely out of dancing and teaching for. So if, if we look back to 15 years ago to now, uh, in the last five years, I've definitely, obviously I, I had started. Uh, and when I say, obviously, again, if this is your first time tuning in, I picked up like a studio here and a studio there mm-hmm. just and I taught there once a week while my family was running our business. And um, yeah, I, I think the the one company that I started working for six and seven years ago, I made a lot of connections through that. And then I started getting asked to teach at this studio for their summer intensive, this studio for their summer intensive and networking, just networking that way. And that that's, five years ago especially was when i was like five and six years ago this the month of august i was like all over the place it was it was to the point where i remember you you were having to like turn things down you were getting so many offers and that i was i was like all right i mean he he at least is getting his name out there and you know to to actually you know get so much that you have to start turning things down that's saying something too it's one thing if you're turning it down because you may not think it's suitable but if you're turning it down because you know i can't fit it in my schedule right you know, that, that's not never a bad thing to have it's just you know you know people want your uh you know your amount of work and they like what you do expertise so to speak yeah, yeah right yeah whatever you I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I i say that with humility and humbleness obviously mm-hmm. um but yeah Dude, I, I, and speaking of that when we get to the olympic talk CCH levels were riding high on one guy in the in the track and field. I, I and if you're talking if you're thinking about the guy that I'm thinking about, I uh, I was just when he was talking on the mic, I'm like his CCH levels are pretty off. He he needs to kind of he, he needs to have a, a sit down with the one said podcast dude and really, <laughs> <laughs> and really get those in check cuz uh although he met he did um get gold and bronze uh, he did get gold in the 100. He did get the bronze, I think, in the 200. But then he got COVID. See? Like, right in the middle of the Olympics, he got COVID. I think right in the middle of the Olympics, yeah. Mm. So, uh, yeah, we could talk a little bit more in length uh, about that person. If you know who he is, uh, people who are listening, then you already know. But uh, uh, you were you were just bringing up the the uh, humbleness and everything, and I had to just throw that in there. I'm like, that, that, that that guy was definitely. I'm like, he needs to sit down with us because he needs a little bit of a uh, a little balance in his life. <laughs> He's through the roof, right? Um, <laughs> on on one end of the spectrum, right? And yeah, we've talked about balance with the CCH levels. We've talked about balance with quality of life. Like we we did that conversation. Yeah, um, I want to say three or four months ago at this point. Um, so I guess that would be like 12 to 15 episodes back at this point. It's crazy that it's already August, man. I mean, yeah. we're pretty much half like 
we're over halfway through the the year already. This year's gone by so quick, and I'm not sure if it's just because I, you know, having an, another kid this year and then going through a whole another life change. Uh, you know, Grayson just turned seven months uh over the weekend, so you know he's getting bigger. It's crazy, man. It's like time just needs to slow down. <laughs> yeah, well, this point a year ago, um, you and Jen, like Jen was mm, four months along. So yeah, like, you, yeah. You, you, you knew that that was like, so you were in the process of like, okay, she's not, she's not third term yet. Yeah, at this point and at least a year ago, the summer she wasn't like at the end of her pregnancy being in the summer. That would have been hell. So I'm like, all right, at least it's in the first, like, first and like the beginning of the second trimester for for summer. So at least, I mean, I'm sure any type of uh, time being pregnant is, is not great in the summer, but at least it's in the beginning. So you know, you're, at least you're not feeling a whole bunch of pregnancy uh symptoms at and you don't like really the the baby's not fully grown at that point well oh so. you mean you mean like little tone because i mean he... well, I was saying grayson yeah i mean yeah I, aunt, I... with aunt yeah she was like re- she was definitely like seven eight months uh eight nine in in those last uh couple weeks so she was feeling it at that point with aunt in, in, like, in july came, yeah yeah yes and then uh and I think it was maybe two or three weeks before he was born. We were down in, in Ocean City, Jersey, and that was when COVID was still around. So we had just gone down there because we didn't want to, uh, you know, you know, cancel anything. We just made sure to spray everything down. And it was kind of nice because, I mean, <laughs> I got I got to fish a whole lot because there was really nothing else to do. And uh, yeah, it actually worked out for Jen with like her first pregnancy like that. Yeah. Th- I mean, she if anything, you know, with the pandemic, she was working for a little bit and then she got to be home for pretty much the rest of the pregnancy. So she was just on leave for most of the time. So almost I would say six to seven months out of the nine, she wasn't working almost. Right. She can correct me if she wants. She probably would if she heard this right now. But uh, most of it, she was not working. She was just being able to, you know, just be pregnant at home and just, you know, do her thing. thing. So, well, and you guys, you guys didn't have to balance like go like a schedule to be out and go doing things. And she didn't have to worry about like, oh, I'm not really feeling up for it today. Like, I'm. Like she's like, yeah. okay, nope, I'm just gonna stay right here. <laughs> and plus, the fact it was just on the scarier side because we had no clue about, you know, how it affected pregnant women. So we're like, there's no point in you going outside or us doing a whole lot. So just stick right here and we're fine. And you know, that whole ordeal. But uh, yeah, uh, for the weekend, like I was saying, Grayson turned seven months this weekend, and he actually got to go to, well, not that he did, not that we were going to leave him anywhere, but uh, he came with us to sea isle yesterday. And uh, we, we didn't really get on the beach because usually it's the time that we get to, you know, go to sea isle for the day. Cause her cousins are there down, down there for a week and they invite us down there for the day. So we go down there and chill and uh, I'll usually go fishing with her cousin. And we had a pretty good, uh fishing outing we were out there for maybe two two and a half hours and there's this uh pier out on 59th street and we've been going there for the last like three or four years and just zonking every year like it was it i think last year was the first time i caught like at least one fish out of that pier so it's usually a bomb yeah it's usually a bomb (laughs) because the thing is we'll get down there and i mean when you're down the shore if pe- people are, you know, into fishing down the shore, you want to make sure you're fishing around the high tide. So either you're fishing two hours before the high tide or two hours after the high tide. So that's usually the playing field of like that four hour window. And when we would go down there for that day, sometimes the high tide would already be coming uh, in or to already be going out. So by the time sometimes we would get out there, we were an hour too late or we wouldn't be getting there at a good time. So the fishing would be the, the tide wouldn't be on our side, but yesterday it was at one forty-five. We got there at like 
we rolled up to their place at like 1130. We got out there maybe around one o'clock. Mm-hmm. So we were right in the thick of it. Uh, and, you know, we had the bait, we had everything and we were just getting bites after bites after bites. And, you know, it was just like that, that perfect fishing day where you had the right bait, you were there at the right time. And, you know, we were just, we caught what, four, three or four different species. We got sea bass, got sea robins, we got croaker, and I caught this big ass uh, eel at the end. And he, nice. just, he just fucked up my line. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was crazy. It's literally like a sea snake. So uh, I wasn't touching it with my bare hands. Uh, and thankfully, Matt, Jen's cousin, I'm sure he won't mind me saying his name. Uh, he thankfully had a pair of gloves in the car. So he ran back, got a pair of gloves, and he was able to hold the thing down because i was trying to hold it down with my with my uh foot and it would just slither right off my foot so i'm trying to you know put uh my foot on his head to kind of get the hook out but it would just slither right off my foot and i'm like all right well this ain't gonna work so he's like hey i got gloves in my car he ran to get the gloves and then he was able to hold on to the thing while i was getting the uh hook out of his mouth but the thing was i had a a double hook rig so it was hooked in the mouth and then the other hook was hooked like around his tail. So then it was slithering all around and then the line was getting tangled up in him as well. So it would be slithering out, but then it would be twirling around and more of the line was getting caught in him. So I'm trying to get both hooks out of him. And usually if I was there by myself, I would have cut the thing and called it a day. But I was like, I, I would have felt bad because the two hooks were in him. He was probably going to die anyway. So I'm like, well, let's just try to at least get this thing out of him. Thankfully, I got it off him. Uh, the line came off. I'm like, all right, throw him back in. We're done. <laughs> and then that, and whatever that, happens to him after that. Hey, the hooks are out of you, bud. Whatever <laughs> happens after that, that's not my fault. Like, <laughs> it's, it's in God's hands, right? <laughs> it's, it's in God's God's plan. <laughs> God's plan. God's plan. But that right. was the first time I actually caught an eel. I've never caught an eel. I've had somebody who caught one, and I used it for bait before, but I've never caught one myself. I thought it was a big flounder because the thing just went like, like the the bite just went like right down. I'm like, oh my god, because I was just you know talking, and all of a sudden I felt my rod just like bend down really fast. I'm like, oh geez, because we hadn't caught anything in a couple minutes. So I'm like, oh, there's one. And I thought it was a big flounder because it was just it usually if you're it's like going like this when you're reeling it in. It was just like staying down. I'm like, all right, this is something big. And then it was already coiled up. So it, when it came to surface, it looked like a big mouth. And I'm like, what is this? And I'm like, oh, it's an eel. Cause it, it like, it had like the two uh, body parts like right up against each other. So it looked like a mouth. And I'm like, oh my God. Even Matt was like, what is that? <laughs> and at first I was scared to bring it up cause I didn't know what it was, but then I'm like, oh, it's an eel. Okay. So, but it, it was cool. And Matt got to catch a couple things too. He caught a pretty decent sized croaker. And I was like, if we had enough time down there, I'd have been like, Hey, keep that thing. We'll throw it in the surf and try to catch a shark or something. <laughs> so overall, you could say y'all had the master bait, right? The master bait. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty sweet. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was one, one of those fishing outings. Like you had the, you had the bait, you had the right bait. You were out there at the right time. You had the, you had the rigs. You had everything. And some I, I never used this type of bait, but something made me want to buy it yesterday uh, was clams. You can just get them frozen. And, uh, you know, they have them like a little jar frozen. And you uh, get them by like the pound or something. So I'm like, I never buy them. So I'm like, just throw it in there. So I'm like, well, if we're going to have it, I might as well try it out. So uh, I threw it in there within five minutes. They just started like tearing it up. I'm like, all right, this is obviously working. So we're just going to keep at it. And then, you know, then everybody around was catching. I'm like, all right, there has to be schools of fish out there because they're just, you know, taking them right when you put them into water. So it, it was cool. So the, usually I like to try to get out shore fishing a couple of times. I'll probably be able to get another a uh, couple of times next month. Cause we'll be going down for our, our uh our week trip so i'll be able to get out for a little bit of time there but um 
I used to try to be able to get out in like June and July, but again, family things. You can't really always leave the house whenever you want now. But uh, when you get out, it's good. <laughs> yeah, I still remember uh, how many years ago did I run down with you and your brother and your dad? It had to have been three years ago three or four years ago it was that was a fun time i i want to say it was like 2021 um makes sense and i remember yeah 21 21 or 22 i remember because i this is so stupid (laughs) (laughs) whoopsie let's say this I remember going into a shop and buying a specific hat because I was like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I had that hat for like a month and I wore it to death and I lost it. I don't even know where it went. I was so mad. I remember. Yeah, because we were in the we were in the bait and tackle shop. Yep. And Cheyenne just ran across a picture of us that we had. Then I was wearing a hat and she was like, oh, yeah, remember that hat? I was like, yeah, I miss it because I don't like spending money on shit that I don't need. And I don't need hats. And I don't, some people need their hats to look like super clean. And I'm like, no, I have a Phillies hat that I got a year ago. And I'm like, this is lasting me through the dance season. And I just like wash it and clean it. But it's, it's, it's not even a solid black. Now it's so faded. I'm like, all right, back to school hat is coming. Um, And when I say back to school, I usually get my back to school stuff in October when my finances get regimented again. (laughs) Like, yeah. All of September, everyone sees Mr. Jim, and I'm like, yeah, this is all of my not fresh clothes from last season. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, like, October time, I'm like, all right, we're back into the swing of things, and uh, I need a couple new fresh updos. I need new kicks. Like, I, I need new shoes. I need new hat. Like, I need all this stuff. But, um, you know, just. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in the runnings for some new gig shoes because the ones that I'm wearing are starting to, you know, they're, they're – they're hanging on, but they're starting to show a little bit. So I'm like, I looking think, a I little think, tethered from that uh, foot yeah, pedal. It's from, you know? Yeah, it's from you know throwing them on the loop pedal and everything, just stomping all around. So I'm like, yeah, I think it's maybe in another couple of months I might be shopping for another, uh, you know, pair of gig shoes and stuff. I'll and I'll use the ones that I'm using now. They'll be like my uh, backup pair, in in some sort. I'll probably still go with like the boots and stuff because I like I like wearing them. And then, uh, you know, with the, you know, attire that I'm usually wearing, like the, the button down jeans and like the boot. So yep. it's usually my typical show. I, I rarely wear shorts to shows. Even in the summer, I rarely wear shorts. Can't say I've seen you do a gig in shorts, which is like. I, in the I... last 10 years, it's been probably once. <laughs> But and I almost I, had a gig this past Saturday up in Long Beach. I was tempted to wear shorts that day because I'm like, it's going to be hot. I might as well just, but I'll throw it like on like a beach uh, button down, but I might wear shorts because I'm like, I'm going to be out. I'm probably going to be playing outside because it was a beach bar. Yep. There's gonna be no way I'm going to be playing outside in pants for three hours. So I'm like, I might as well wear shorts that day. I'll, I'll break my uh, cycle of wearing pants. I'll, I'll wear shorts that day at least. Yeah, but it's if you have like when you were first getting into gig playing, if you always wore pants and you were like, this is in my comfort zone, I want to feel comfortable. Yeah. I totally get that because even me with teaching like basketball shorts or like joggers or sweatpants for me, it's it depends on like the type of class that I'm teaching. If it's a class where I know I'm going to break like tremendous sweat and um, it's more important for like the definition of my leg lines to be shown, I'll wear basketball shorts, but otherwise I want to wear joggers or or pants. Like it's just my thing. I have worn shorts in the performance setting. Probably the same percentage as you wearing shorts doing gigs like once or twice. I can remember, I can remember one point blank routine where we, all had like these maroon jorts and when i say Mm -hmm. when i say jorts yes i'm 
definitely mean jorts, but this <laughs> this was 12 years ago, if memory serves me correctly. Um, it was jorts and like tanks. Tanks were very in, if you remember, like 10, I'd say 11 to 13 years ago, like tanks were yeah very much in as far as fashion went for uh, the summer. Not that people don't wear tanks in the summer. I'm talking about like guys in tanks, like became yeah. a thing for a couple years. I did there. it for a little bit when I was actually in shape. <laughs> yeah, dude, I, <laughs> I had like m- my one favorite tank from 10 years ago. Uh, I threw it on a couple days ago because I was doing laundry and I was like, I need some just random thing. And it yeah. was 95 degrees outside. And I was like, I'm going to throw this tank on. And I'm like, Oh man, this looks so much cooler on me 10 years ago than it does now. <laughs> yeah. I still had the stringers that I would use at the gym and I threw one on. I'm like, yuck. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> Pathetic. Like, <laughs> like I'm going to take this off. <laughs> the principal from The Simpsons just looking down like, Pathetic. Yeah. yeah. Pathetic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, like I said, I don't wear too many tank tops anymore. But uh, for for the fact, unless, unless they're not like the very thin ones, if they cover like I'll do like the half sleeve ones, if anything. Mm-hmm. But very rarely, or if I have like the shirts that are like the the sleeve cut off, but they have like the narrow, you know slit down here yeah it shows your trap definition and your shoulders bit. and yeah. when you when you don't have the definition it's like what the Whoopsie. are you doing with yeah. that shit on <laughs> all right traps are good here but then you're like okay everything else just don't show like <laughs> and, and this is why i can't wait for hoodie weather right right <laughs> yeah dude i woke up this morning i know everyone is so enthralled by this conversation right now um <laughs> i i tested going out to DoorDash, which I do like as a side thing in in the summer months, like where my teaching situation isn't regulated. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm like, okay, just extra cash, whatever. Right. So I set my alarm for 4 a.m. I left at 4.15 and I was scheduled for 4.30 to 7. And I was driving around. I went all the way up to downtown Westchester. I went all the way down Route 3. I stopped at a Wawa because like it tells you where like the hot spots are. Mm-hmm. So I was following this hot spot this, and like just waiting for it to give me a dash. And then I got to the Wawa and I was like, I think I'll just check my tire pressure since I'm driving around a little bit. Yeah. Um, did that. I just got new tires like um, two months ago. And so they were fine, but doesn't hurt to check. And then yeah, I I'm drove for some new tires as well. Yeah. I mean, it's never a fun thing, but when they're balding, the last thing you want is for one of them to blow. And then you're just right off the it's, road. It, it, yeah. You're off the road and over in no Europe good. somewhere. Right. No boy. No buenos. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then it was six o'clock. I was out for an hour and a half and I was like, because for me, I was like, okay, maybe someone is up super early or works third shift and is coming home. And I was like, maybe they don't want to make anything. At the same time, they're probably like, no, no drivers are out there door dashing at 430 in the morning. So it was my one time to test. And of course, also, it was a Monday morning. And I was like, mm. yeah, this is a bust. But now I know I'm like, ain't happening again it's not like i'm missing out on opportunity if i sleep in a little bit on a monday morning Um, unless you're getting that one dude that's like i don't i want coffee but i don't feel like going to wawa i hope somebody's out there so they can just bring me a coffee and you're just suddenly out there like ding there you go (laughs) yeah and i i would make that delivery and earn probably four dollars on it (laughs) (laughs) then you can buy yourself that same cup of coffee Uh, yeah (laughs) um and the but, cycle continues <laughs> yeah it, it was a it was cool though because i when i like every other time that i am out dashing and doing other orders i'm paying attention to traffic i'm paying attention to like uh the gps which is telling me where to go because i like it's usually taking me into uncharted territories right right um so it was nice because i was out on the usually shine and i will dash together uh i dash during the day while she's at work on occasion if i'm not doing a thing Mm. uh work wise 
but in the evenings we'll ride out together. Um, but I had work related things on my mind. So I was able to think about them while I was driving because I didn't have to navigate traffic. I wasn't doing deliveries in uncharted territory. So mm-hmm. that was good because like there were things just stirring around in my brain that I hadn't really been able to tend to over the weekend. So it was good to kind of zero in on that mentally. Um, right. So, yeah. Uh, I wanted, I was going somewhere with that. I don't know why. Oh, yes. We were talking about hoodies. Can't wait for that weather. I stepped outside this morning at 4.15 and it was 66 degrees outside. Whew. It, I was like, hmm. Because we literally moved in here June 1st and it got hot real fast. Really fast. Yeah, and, went right into a heat wave. <laughs> I mean, the heat wave was like at the end of June, but it was like in the 80s almost mm-hmm. instantly. Like we, we didn't even get spring barely at all. So, um, I'm excited for this fall weather coming because we're, it's not, it's not going to go from really hot to super freezing cold. Like it, it just doesn't do that. Sometimes it does, but yeah, I have a feeling we'll probably have a gradual, a somewhat of a gradual, like slope back down to cooler weather. Cause again, you know, we just started August, but the end of next month, we'll, we're probably going to be back down to like seventies, sixties, you know, the so. best, the best. I, I can recall. I'm, rem- I'm okay with that too. I mean, I love hot weather, but I don't like when it's like dread, like that dry heat. I don't like that, but I mean, summer baby, I'm okay with hot weather, but I do agree. Like the, the sudden change from summer to fall weather, like that 60 to seven degree, weather in the morning and then throughout the day that's like you like you don't need a jacket you don't need pants you're still okay with shorts and maybe a long sleeve that's perfect yeah i mean like jean pants and a t-shirt e- even joggers are like light sweats and a tee yeah, 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 yeah. or basketball shorts and a light hoodie mm. get me there yeah and I'm good. Like that's how, that's what the weather was this morning because I could have done either. I left with I think pants and a t-shirt, and I was like, "This is this is my my favorite." I mean, I was obviously born in the winter, uh, and I don't know why I, I keep saying obviously. I was like everybody Whoopsie. knows who I am. Right? We know, <laughs> yeah, <duh. laughs> um No, I was. I'm not a summer baby. I was born at the end of February, so. Um, I do like the winter because uh, for me, I'm, I just feel like, oh, you can always bundle up and you can always layer up and throw more clothes on to insulate yourself and keep warm. That's um, what everybody says. Like, you, you can always get yourself warm, but you never get like the same. Like, you know, like when you're hot, you can never get yourself cold. It's, it's tougher to cool down. Yeah. Uh, our bodies are designed to sweat to cool down. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I don't want to say who loves sweating because you know, athletes and people that work out and they're like, mm-hmm. oh, I love breaking that sweat. Um, it's just, I, I don't like it being cold for no reason. <laughs> if it's going to be cold, it better snow. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just like, I hate the cold. Well, and for me, when it's hot, hot, like if I'm outside, I better be in the water somewhere. Mm hmm. Like, I don't I don't like going to the beach when it's really hot because I won't get in the water and just stay in the water. And then if I'm yeah. laying on a beach towel and it's baking outside, um, not my cup of tea. Yeah. Just like sweating on the beach. Yeah. yeah that's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Like you go in the water and you get out and, and you're drying off and you're like, I can't tell if I'm still wet from the water from yeah, wet from or if you're sweating, sweating again. <laughs> yeah that's part of it and i'm a beach guy but yeah that's like something like okay you you come out of the water and then you're drying off and you're still sweating so it's like okay it's like you're every time you wipe off there's just more water coming off you <laughs> well it's like it's like when you get out of the shower in the summer and oh I like you, you dry off and then you're clammy again and you're like i don't feel refreshed I just anymore end up going into my room because i'm like because then that's like the coolest part because then you'll uh, like your whole bathroom is all, uh, you know, steamed up and everything. And every time you 
try to dry yourself off, you know, you're just getting all that moisture back on you. So I'm like, all right, let me just go into my room and I'll dry myself off and use that help. So then you're, you're out of like the whole steam room that you just made. Yeah. I guess I'm referring back to um, like when we were kids and living with other people and you didn't have the luxury mm-hmm. to just step out of the bathroom. And when I, yeah. and when I say back to when we were kids, and you were living with other people. I'm talking about me three months ago. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I live. I'm still a new new. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. I'm still new to this like whole freedom of like, I can step out of my shower and go into my bedroom where the air conditioner is running and be like, this is where it's at. Right. <laughs> it's just a, you know, one of the perks it's of. Good, yeah. It's a, it's a good perk. It's good. Life. Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> So many good things in living here in the past two and a half months. Um, I, I bet. <laughs> yeah. And the one big thing is I talked about like the freedom of just our kitchen is right there. We live in a small place and we've been loving it. Um, but I have been eating so much, man, like to the fact that I need to actually, yeah. I need to actually that's dial the, in on my control of like my diet. It's too, like, like- when I was first in the apartment, I'm like, I can eat whenever I want. It's like, <laughs> and yeah. th- that was just so hard to kind of contain. Cause you're like, you know, again, when you're at your parents' house, you're like, okay, you don't want to wake anybody up because uh, then you're like, okay, I don't want to have to go back down to the fridge, get something. I'm not going to wake anybody up. But then, you know, you're at your own house. Like it's my house. I'll go down and get something. And, you know, then you'll, you know, raid the refrigerator three months later. You're like, okay, where'd this 30 pounds come from? <laughs> Yeah. Have you ever wanted to start your podcast but didn't know where to start? The One Set Bros are here to talk to you about Zencaster. Zencaster is the ultimate base podcasting solution and now the all-in-one podcasting platform making podcasting easy. They've sure made it easy for us to be able to record our podcast and our episodes every week for you guys. Once you've set up your account, you're simply one click away from recording a high-quality podcast with studio-quality sound and up to 4K video with your guests. My personal favorite feature is their multi-layer backups, which ensure our recordings are always in the highest quality, even during unstable web connections. And if you thought you needed multiple tools and services for your podcast, Zencaster's only one podcasting platform allows you to create your podcast all in one place and distribute to Spotify, Apple, and other major destinations. Go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use our code OneSetPod and you'll get 30% off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan. I want you to have the same easy experience as we do with all our podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. Yeah, I um, I got a scale for Christmas a few years ago. Mm-hmm. One, one of those like Bluetooth ones that you step on and like it yeah, has an yeah, app yeah. and it does all of your metrics for you. Um, I, I've, we brought it here when we moved in and we'd been using it like just to like check the number to see yep. where we are just out of curiosity because we hadn't used it in a while. There was a, um, something was wrong and it, it and it wouldn't load my metrics onto my app mm-hmm. and I un- uninstalled it, reinstalled it. And it was like jacked up, but that was three years ago. And since then I've gotten a new phone yeah. and, and just like this, the scale disappeared. I like, right. Just didn't use it. Uh, so we've been using it uh, this morning. I stepped on and I opened the app on my new phone and it started loading everything. I was like, oh, this should be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, way to right. start off the Monday morning. <laughs> yeah, but it's good because I'm trying to like kick my ass into gear for this new season coming yeah. up. So it's like I have realistically a good four weeks after this episode drops. It'll be more like three and a half. But um, I've been waiting for this moment to be like, okay. Now's the time where I need to like really take advantage of like my free time before I get the busy regular schedule again. Um, let me see where I'm at. And it said my last time logging in my information was actually two years ago. And the app was like, 
it's been a minute and your numbers are really off. Yeah. Do you want to try again? And I was like, it's kind of like my fitness pal. Like, where are you at, buddy? You forgot to log in your dinner today. Like, yeah. I don't want to tell you what I ate for dinner. Like, <laughs> you don't want to hear what I had for dinner. <laughs> so I looked at my numbers and yeah, they're not like my favorite numbers, but um, they all really look manageable. So I'm like, dude, you are coming up on like, I know your birthday just passed and you just turned 38. Mm -hmm. I told myself when I turned 37 that I had three years until I turned 40. And and by the time I get to 40 that I wanted to be in, I wanted to be happy about my health overall, not, not just how I look, but how I felt. Um, so it's just lifestyle changes. And again, right. I think it was good for me to step on this morning and see the numbers and understand like, Hey, I know that I have to actually control when I eat. And literally I got off the scale and I looked at my numbers, uh, hung out for like 10, 15 minutes. And I was like, all right, I'm going to make a plain omelet, avocado, banana, a little bit of orange juice, because that was my thing. When we moved in, I would drink a whole full glass of orange juice Mm -hmm. and, and not realize like, okay, it's good for you if you are athletic and, and like the sugar is not killing you. Yeah. Um, I just haven't been doing a lot of the fitness things. It, like, and even this, then, like if you're moving around a lot, then yeah, it's not going to really be too much of a damage. But if you're having that and then just sitting and watching TV for five hours, yeah, it's probably not the best thing to have for you. But if you're having it and then you're, you know, going out running errands and being active, you know, at least it's, going to break down and kind of be more beneficial to you. And, you know, that's, it's the more thing of just being more active instead of trying to uh, stay in a sedentary type of lifestyle. Right. It, and it doesn't necessarily always mean like, Oh, going to the gym. It can just be like going out and walking for like 15, 20 minutes. That's better than sitting down. Nobody said you had to run. It's like, right. You know, just going out and taking a, taking a walk, uh, you know, if you if you uh, have a mailbox and like, OK, if I can walk to the mail, go down and walk to the mailbox and instead of taking your car uh, to the, the you know, like your P.O. box, if you can walk, if like if, I know for us, you know, sometimes we'll get on the way home. But if me and Anth are, uh, you know, outside, and we need to get the mail. I'll just walk down to the, the, po- the little uh, our little mailbox. And it's literally right down the street from us. So just walk down and walk back. And like, hey, okay. I mean, at least you got some, you know, footsteps in. And instead of just being like, oh, well, I'll just get it the next time I'm in the car. Yeah. And like I said, like, we've loved being in a small apartment where like, hey, everything is right here. There's not a lot of room to lose stuff, which yeah, has been really fortunate. It's like, oh, I can't find this. I'm like, <clears throat> it's literally within normally 90 seconds. Like, Mm -hmm. okay, it's either over here, in here, over there, or over there. And that's, (laughs) um, and if, if it's like two minutes and we can't find it, it's like, check the car. And then like, so outside of our previous location where it was a bigger house with a lot more people and other people moving things around here and there, um, yeah, that it's been nice, but just getting good with um okay if is there room for me to do at home exercising here uh the answer is yes i can definitely move things around and make it happen Mm -hmm. um but also uh i got into a headspace um years and years ago where i despised working from home and Mm -hmm my my partners in business um loved it right um but i detested it so much because it wasn't productive because so many outside personal life interferences tended to interfere you know um yeah it has its pros and cons just like anything yeah. And the, the con of it all was, you know, oh, we got to travel to the business to do business talk. Why don't we just do it here? And I'm like, because of the distractions. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
mm-hmm. because if we were in the space and we're talking about, oh, like just things that made the overall efficiency of like the program within the building, it's like, okay, well, let's go look in the other room while we're already here. Um, yeah. But also just being in the mindset, right? And you're more um, focused too. Yeah. In the, in the, you know, environment instead of, you know, being like this, you know, and trying to do like a type of, um, you know, meeting or something, you know, you'll be attending, but your focus will be a little more prominent than, you know, when you're in person with people rather than doing it through a, you know, a computer. Right. Right. Um, even choreographing for me, like personally at this point, I, I struggle to choreograph at home because when I'm home, I like mentally just want to be in like my homey headspace where Mm -hmm. obviously there's things to do around here that are chore related. Obviously I do like administrative and planning things that aren't the creative space of it. Yeah. Um, I did build out that studio, uh, in my parents' basement, which, um, I do, I do certain projects there, um, because I've been ingrained to do certain jobs in that space works Mm -hmm. and certain jobs that I try to go and create for. And like, my brain just doesn't allow me, I like, I don't know about you as an artist and, um, you know, with guitar, I know you have your space built out in your basement. Um, Mm -hmm. but do you ever feel like creatively stuck in a spot? And, and when I say creatively, I, I know that is kind of, I guess in the conversation I'm talking about on the parallels of you, like songwriting, but like writer's block. Yeah. Writer's block. Exactly. Yeah. So, but you're working your loop board and you're like, Oh, I want to play with this. I want to play with this. Do you ever feel like, because you're at home that like, it's tougher for you to really try to like dial into what you're doing? Or do you feel like you have, um, like the mental compartmentalization where you can say, okay, it's, uh, you know, wife and kids are in bed and I'm down here and I'm doing a for me thing. And and this is what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Uh, I guess you can kind of say it's a little bit of both and I'll, I'll take it from both aspects of like, if I'm, you know, doing some home studio work or if I'm, you know, practicing for my gigs, like you said, usually it's the time where, you know, kids wife are in bed. I got my time to kind of just, you know, be down here and have my me time. If I'm working, you know, on some stuff for gigs, it's like, okay, I'm either working on a song, then you're figuring, okay, how do I work this into the looping? Or if it's a song that doesn't need looping, you know, okay, learn the lyrics, how do the chords, you know, match up with the, the lyrics, then you have to mentally go through the lyrics and singing them at the same time, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So you're, uh, you know, having the chord changes match up with the lyrics and, you know, then there's times where it's like, okay, this isn't working. Uh, you know, then you're taking the next couple of minutes to figure out how do you, you know, troubleshoot it or how to you, how do you either make it easier or is there a way to get around what's going on? Uh, as far as like the studio work, you know, there will be times where, you know, when I first got this new whole setup behind me. Like, I was very inspired to just be like, hey, turn it on, press record, and go. Like, I was inspired to the to the moon. Well, it's the same thing with your new loop pedal, right? Like, when you got that, you're yeah, like, oh, this very is... very inspired. This is, like, let's go. And that was me when I had my, like, my company shows um, two weekends ago. Yeah. Seeing all the dancing, being around that energy. I came out yeah. of that and was like, okay, I am ready to drive up new creative. And, yeah. and not... And, and not because I'm seeing things. I'm like, oh, let me steal this. Let me plagiarize this. It's not even. It's not even yeah. like that. It's just like whenever I would go to competitions and see dancers from other walks of life and see them on stage, carrying out and performing um, the artistry in that circuit in that uh, department of the entertainment industry. Um, 
it would inspire me and feel like, okay, these people are doing something so super different. So why, why, why am I stuck doing the same stuff? Why can't I like bridge out and start exploring other opportunities? There's no one, there's no one telling me, no, that's bad. Right. Right. And that's, that's the beauty of, you know, that's the pro if we're talking pros and cons, that's the pro of, Mm -hmm. you know, the creative industry, the con is okay, but is this going to sit well with, you know, the performer that I set the material on. And, and I guess for you, you're creating, uh, you know, you're doing your cover work and you're, you're putting your spin on all the looping work that you're doing. And it's like, okay, there's nobody telling you that you're wrong, but you want your audience to perceive it and, and receive it well. Right. Yeah. Like you have certain songs that are like, okay, you can cover all these things, but you know, if you're playing a whole country set is country music, gonna really go over well with that type of crowd maybe that type of crowd isn't really into country music then okay you're like playing music they don't want then they tune out so well it's like it's the same thing if you go in and play like more upbeat stuff and your audience wants more mellowed out tunes right Right. it's the same thing yeah and uh i think i told you way past like with episodes prior that the one thing that i do if this is going on in the establishment that I'm going to, if they have music playing, I listen to what music is playing. And that usually gives me a little bit of an idea of what to play and like how to adjust and adapt, how to adjust and like, okay, if is the music a beat, is it a certain genre? Is it a certain, you know, time like nineties, 2000 modern way back when, uh, so then you, you can kind of give yourself a little bit of leverage. Like, okay, I can play these tunes tonight, this and that. Or if you are, and then within that first set, if you're getting a lot of, you know, things that are like, okay, they don't, they're responding, but they're not like coming up to me like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, this and that. Then you can kind of start being like, okay, let me try another type of music or another genre, another time see if that hits then once you do that then you're like okay now you can stick with either those type of things of music age etc so that's kind of how you know i'll just go off that set list and then just start rambling out certain songs that i know and once those things start hitting i try to stay within that you know uh you know system so if people are wanting to hear more upbeat i try to stay within that uh you know upbeat system if people are really digging it and if people are really just you know not really hitting i'm like all right then it's time to be like just play what you want and something will hit eventually and if it doesn't you know it's not like people are booing you out of the place as long as you don't have people like that but you know i think it's to the point where sometimes uh you get the point where people don't really respond to you but they know you're there they're just cool to have background music So it's not like they're not responding to you because they don't like you. I think it's just more because they're just enjoying the background music, but they're not really paying, paying attention. Well, they didn't enter the establishment for the live music. They're, yeah, they're, they're just like, okay, we came here with the intention of we're catching up with this friend or, oh, this is, this is our regular week hangout with so-and-so and So it's not like they don't appreciate the music. It's just more like that's not their thing that they're going for that night. They can appreciate that you're doing what you're doing, but they're not going to pay attention too much. So it's just more like, you know, when, like I said, you've been to John Warren's a couple of times now. It's like you'll you'll get people that, you know, will will respond. Then you'll get people that are just there to be there and chill and hang out. And then later in the night, you might get a whole nother round of other people. Then you might get a whole nother you know, reaction to people. Cause then there might be people coming in to be like, Oh, okay, cool. He's playing music. Let me, uh, you know, while I'm getting a drink, let me see what he's playing. And if he likes something, Oh, Hey, do you know this? So then, you know, you have a couple of those people that'll, you know, want to interact with you more, or there's people that are just there to have a beer call it a night, you know? So it's, you're, you're going through so many shades of people throughout the night and you want to, constantly and, and within those times i'm constantly just saying like hey uh you know for the the round of people that just came in my name is and do the whole spiel of you know uh what i'm doing if you guys want to come up 
you know, if you have a certain song, if I can play it, I'll play it for you. Uh, you know, you know, hope you're enjoying your night, drinks, food, shout out to the bartender, servers, everything, all the whole spiel. And, you know, I try, I try to at least do that twice every, during a set every like half hour, at least kind something of something like that. Like if yeah. I, if I peripherally see new people walking in, you like, try you try to drop it in like a couple minutes after they're yeah. in there, just sort of reintroduce yourself and kind of lay the land for them, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So then, uh, so then I so then it's not like after every song or two, it's just like okay, let the people come in, and then you know, then throw your spiel, do a couple songs, and you know, if you see a couple, you know, like a whole flock of other people, then you have to do it again. So usually it's like yeah, like once or twice in a set or something. And uh, speaking of John Morton's, are you playing there like pretty soon? Yeah, uh, I'll be back there this Friday, which uh, when this comes out, it's going to be tonight. There you go. uh, I'll be there from 8 to 11, rocking out there. I I love it there. It's uh, been uh, a pretty cool spot that I've been doing since October of last year. And 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 where is John Morton's again, by the way? John Morton's is in Prospect Park. So it's right in Delco. Right off the uh, McDay Boulevard, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, for our friends that are in Jersey or Delaware that are close by and are like, we don't know where Prospect Park is. Yeah, Pennsylvania. You're, <laughs> you're, you're looking off Exit Nine, off of Ninety Five, yes. just just uh, three miles south of the Philadelphia Airport. If you wanted to catch Anthony tonight at John Morton's <clears throat> Tavern, and that's is that right before or after the John Hines Wildlife Exit? on 95 exit nine is the x ex- exton exit right or exit nine is the prospect park essington exit essington, uh, yeah so, the, so that's before john hines I yeah because I, I think that that one's ex- exit 10 yeah because i know eight is really park seven is 476 right um yeah six is edgemont avenue five is curlin four is the commodore barry three uh, takes you to the Conchester. Mm-hmm. Uh, two would take you um, to Market Street, four fifty two. One takes you to Chiave, and then you are Chiave. in Delaware. Yep. So, yeah, uh, it's a cool little spot. I mean, it's a small corner bar. That there's like a limited amount of parking. It's I love it there. Like, it's my kind it, of bar. I love nice. coming to see you play there. It's and it's, it's, it's like I said, I've been to dive bars. I don't consider that a dive bar. It I've it been, is. I've played at some pretty crappy corner dive bars. I don't really consider. I I would say it's a pretty not upscale, but I'd say it's a subpar corner bar. Yeah, I know we did the restaurant tier thing because we talked about like Panera, and then we went yeah. to, <laughs> and then we went to Applebee's. Was like your your first step above those like yeah. <laughs> high end fast food restaurants, right? Yeah. Um. I and, would, the, and the staff there is wonderful. I mean, and and uh, the and the food is always good. I've always had really good food when I've ordered food there when I've came to see you. So yeah, yeah, I've had I've had a, a little bit of the food there when when I do every once in a while. So yeah, and and they take care of the people there, so I can't really complain. And you know the the bartenders and servers are really nice, and you know the the regulars that are usually there always you know coming in and saying hey how you doing you know they're always looking forward to the music so they like the regulars that are there really love all the music that's being played there so you know you're at least going to get some people that are going to appreciate you playing there so it's not like the people come there and they're like ah they got these effing musicians that are coming in and just then it's screwing up everything you know and i've been there like where you're like, oh, the music, we want to watch the basketball game. I've had times where I played and they had to stop me because people wanted to watch the sports or do this or something. So I'm like, OK, that really put me through a trip because I'm like, all right, do you not, are you doing because you don't like me? Or is it because, you know, they just got to keep the patrons happy because if they if they want to do that. And and do you know? they still do they still pay you? Thankfully, yes, they did. Uh, OK. Yeah, they're like, we're still going to pay you for the full night, but uh, you know the the people want to hear this. They're like, okay, I mean, whatever. They're they're going to lose money on their bar sales if they tell everybody, yeah, no, we're going to let him play versus like, yeah, they would rather pay you out if they know they have the funds to just say, yeah, hey, we're going to kind of shut this one down for the night, and and you're just like, is it me? And it's really not you. It's just like yeah. the 
again, the people have an agenda going into the bar. They're coming in with friends and they want to watch the game and they don't want the live music to interrupt. And that's like right. not to be taken personally. And I'm sure it doesn't feel good when it happens. I've been in similar predicaments where people, you know, uh, I've gone into set choreography before and the choreographer was like, yeah, no, this project, we're actually going to go a different route. And I'm like, is it me? And I'm like, yeah, no, it's not me because I know I'm fucking great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am on the confidence level, borderline cockiness level. No. Um, I just know that what I was like, I would, I went into a project once uh, and I did the first rehearsal and then I walked into the second rehearsal and they were practicing something super different. And the director of the studio like pulled me to the side and was like, um, we'll have a, like an in-depth conversation about this later, but like, we're going to go with like this instead. Mm -hmm. Um, still wanted my input on the piece, but the director had like basically preset a different project. And then I, I just like co choreographed the project on it rather than like, I had a whole vision with what I started with, which right. I'm glad that that transpired after the first rehearsal rather than I was almost done the project. And then it was completely scrapped because yeah. that kind of stuff does happen too. Um, and that, that project actually went on and did really well for the rest of the season, uh, especially at nationals. Um, but yeah, that kind of stuff happens and you have to just try to remind yourself, you know, this, this wasn't a me thing. It just, mm -hmm. what I went into that concept or the, the idea that I had for them is meant to be set for someone else or another right. project that it just wasn't fitting these particular dancers and the director of the team uh, put on audible and was like, let's, let's take this a different direction. And it worked out, like I said, um, but in the immediate moment, it was just like, dude, really? Like, I know, I know I'm not terrible at what I do, but like, it made me feel like I was really inadequate. So kind of a similar, similar spot. Uh, yeah that like piggybacking off of that situation that you had just presented for sure yeah i i so want to get into my new setup here but there's still a couple kinks that i gotta uh get into to get it started uh but i would i'm hoping you know by the fall time i'm gonna start implementing a couple of the, these things into the set and I'll probably be doing the net, the net. I'll be back at John Morton's after this Friday. I'll be back in October. So I'm hoping by October I can, you know, implement at least a set or two of the new setup and, uh, you know, at least start jamming out to that stuff. So I'm going to be adding a couple more instruments and, you know, having more of like a, a one man band feel. So it's, you know, it's to the point of like, I'm bringing more equipment but I'm stepping up the game of, you know, the musicianship of my show. So well, you're, prov it's, you're providing it's an elevated quality. It. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, um, the dynamics that you're adding to the set will be worth the extra equipment on the stage. Even if you're in exactly. a tighter space, you'll make it work. And I know you and I had talked about this more than once off, uh, yeah. off air. And I'm hoping so. eventually this, you know, once I continue to progress this new setup into my show this eventually will help me land more gigs or just more, even more you know different types of gigs i've been thinking of like you know this could be a cool thing to eventually you know get into playing weddings and like you know small corporate things private party things you know so once once i get these things rolling you know next summer or even you know by the new year because usually when you're talking about the uh the beach and the shore a lot of those things are uh starting to get booked like in the beginning of the year like in like jan like the first quarter of the year so usually that's when i start hitting up some of the people that i know who book down the shore i start telling them like hey if you have anything that's like starting to really book out let me know 
uh unfortunately the people that i that i knew they were saying this year that they had already had a lot of the things booked and it was more of like a come as it goes if i have something that needs to be booked i'll let you know or if it's like you know hey we need this specific person then it's like if i have something that i can give you i'll definitely let you know and then that said person hit me up last week to possibly play a show this past saturday but it unfortunately just didn't work out with the uh things so they wanted somebody else to play instead of me but um that's how it goes sometimes sometimes you get things and there was another gig that was the same the same way i uh, um next saturday uh i'm playing in Pottstown, and i've been trying to i've been getting x to play this venue uh, for the last couple of months now, but it was to the point where I wasn't able to play because of either scheduling uh, and there was one time I was, but then I got beat out by somebody. So once I landed, I'm like, all right, cool. At least I can get into a new venue and, you know, maybe this will become another venue I play at, you know, Pottstown there. It's a, it's a little bit far. It's, you know, within the hour and which I'm okay with, because I've always said like, Hey, if I'm willing to go fishing an hour and not get paid, I think I can take a, a gig that's going to be about an hour and I get paid for it. And, so, and you know, you're doing what you love, man. Like, and absolutely. It, as long as you get to work for a few hours and make the trip yeah. worth it. Yeah. As, 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 long, as long as it's definitely worth it with the pay, uh, you know, I'm not going to take something that's going to be like for pennies, but as long as, you know, it's going to, you know, at least put gas in the car and it's worth, you know, the to and from, then I, I'm willing. So, Sweet. Uh, brother, I know we wanted to talk a little yeah. bit more on, <laughs> and that's the thing, we we rolled into this one, and we don't do this very often, but we were like, okay, we only have a couple small bullet points of things that we want to discuss for this one, um, and I'm actually pretty good to hold off on them because yeah, um, as far as the Olympics goes, I did want to dive into them. No, no pun fun. intended. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I also, there's a lot that I didn't get to see just the way the schedule worked. Yeah. Um, definitely. I know you wanted to talk about uh, NBA uh, and the, 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 the one. T- talk about the one guy real quick. We, we got a few minutes. Talk about the one guy with the CCH levels. Okay. So his name is uh, Noah Lyles. So he was the track runner. He won. He won the men's uh, 100 meter, and I think he took bronze in the 200. Uh, but I started seeing him in an interview during the qualifying matches of the 100 meter race. And again, I'm a big track and field guy. I did track in in high school as a uh, off season thing for basketball because I played basketball. So uh, I took a liking to i didn't like it at first i'm like i hate running but then i for some reason i when i was doing it i ended up loving it so whenever i see it i'm always like very strict to the to the tv to watch it but you know this guy comes on and it's noah lyles usa guy so i'm like all right cool let me see uh and he was projected to be one of the better um you know runners out there so he starts talking about like you know uh, I'm not happy with where I placed in the last race, but I know I'm better than that. And I, uh, everybody else should be scared of me because, and they starts talking all that. So I'm like, he, his CCH levels are a little off. He, he, <laughs> he, he, he's very humble. He's confident, but that cockiness level is like, it's like, like that it's stretching out too far it's it's too <laughs> skewed in the wrong way yeah. in the wrong direction and again right? like we've talked about before there's different angles of cockiness like there's there's ways you can be uh cocky but still have it in a good way but you know there's also the same way where it can be bad too there's nothing wrong with it but i think when you have the wrong you know it, it's imbalanced is, when it's is imbalanced what it is. then yeah, yeah. so you, you kind of have to you know adjust that so i just instantly thought of cch levels when when no was talking and i thought it was funny i i wish i would have brought it up to you at, at uh at the moment but i i don't even remember when i was uh seeing we must have just it must have been a weekend or something but uh yeah and with the u.s i'll just briefly say if anybody saw the 
the men's basketball uh, gold uh, match with France. Stephen Curry is a beast. You want to talk about CCH levels? That guy has the proper balance of it. I mean, look at the guy. He does not miss. He hit those last three or four uh, three pointers. the The fourth one, he had two defenders on him, and he just threw that thing up and was just switch. I knew it was going. In. I'm like, bang bang, went in. I'm like, dude, can't. It, we're done. Put him to sleep. Put him to sleep. Yeah, and the clips that it was I, such a good game. The clips that I saw, courtesy of you, where it, he was just like. Like you said, dude, don't miss. But the one where he had the two guys on him, and he was just like, yeah. "Oh, I don't, I don't Whoopsie. care. Watch this, yeah. come!" And, and he just sunk it. I was like, like, "Come on!" And he, and he will practice those things, those shots in practice and game mode too. So it's not like he just throws those things up. He practices those type of shots. Well, and which is insane. And I think that's the kicker is like his mindset doesn't shift whether he has, you know, whether he's in the game or off the court. And yeah, they were talking about this on the radio this morning when I, when I went out to dash at four 30, <laughs> they were talking about, you know, you want to talk about Joel Embiid, the difference between him and, and the super elites is yeah. Joel Embiid. Would you rank him good or great? And the difference between the good and the great is the people that are great, they live and breathe basketball outside yeah. of basketball. Okay. Yep. So, um, and when they said that, I was like, that's the most honest thing that I've heard about Joel Embiid. And that's why people like me and you that that's are a like, good angle. Well, people like me and you, you and I that are, you know, hey, we love what he has done for the 76ers organization. But at the same time, is he you know, historically like the franchise guy that is going to make the 76ers the eight team in the NBA. No, no, <laughs> no. And, you know, there are people out there. I know uh, our buddy Mike that was on the podcast with me uh, six months ago now. Um, you know, he, he, he calls a spade a spade. Right, he loves Embiid because of what he has done for the Sixers, but he will call him on his bullshit too. So I was gonna say, I think we need to get Mike back on because I'm such and like an anti Joel Embiid, and he's <laughs> such like pro, but still on the the fence of him. But I think he's still on like I think he's more pro Embiid, where I'm like anti Embiid. Well, so I think it would be a good conversation between us to be like, like yeah, well, uh, and I understand that like Joel has the potential to be a dominant and not that he isn't already he's he's dominant he has a lot of qualities but i'll say in this until the day he retires his conditioning is what's holding him back yeah the dude got out of shape before the olympics (laughs) and he's going to get out of shape before the start of the season and he does he doesn't know how to keep himself in shape outside and like you said what separates the good from the great, and we're probably going to go on this for another 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> what separates the good from the great is the fact that the greats are always in that mindset off and on the court. Joel, once he's off that court, he doesn't have that mindset anymore. Yeah, he's just ready to play video games again. Um, right. I, I, that's what that's what they were saying on the radio. They're like, yeah, this guy talks about how much he loves video games. It's like, you think Steph Curry loves playing video games? No, he wants to perfect his shots and make sure that when he retires from the NBA, that he's like, hey, check out my numbers and check out yeah. how, and how good I was. Curry's the best shooter of all time. Yeah. He, he's already put that, he cemented that into his legacy. And it and just he's, showed and, up in and, the Olympics. And yeah. then, you know, gold medal in the Olympics. If he retired tomorrow, that would be. I mean, we don't want him to. But if he did, he he's already a legend. Yeah, I, I mean, I was really that was <laughs> that was the best thing about me waking up early and going out this morning was catching that conversation. I was just like, that was pretty good. But I do yeah. got to give a shout out to the U.S. women and France game. Uh, if anybody saw that at the very end, the. Uh, the U.S. team 
they were up by three at the last second. They got a three, and then France got the ball back. The the one girl got the pass down court and threw it to her other teammate, and the other teammate caught the ball. She was right by the three-point line, shot it up, made it, but she was on the three-point line, and they counted it as two, and they lost. They lost by one point. I was I was like wow because I was thinking like what if they because there's enough time for them to come back down and shoot a three because they had just tied it prior to that so when that girl hit that shot I'm like oh she's just on that line so they're not gonna call it a three so uh, U.S. just won that game yeah um... so shout out to the U S men's and women's basketball team for, you know, taking gold and, you know, for France, it, it does suck. Cause I mean, you're in your hometown, uh, you know, home country as, as it is for, for Olympic sake, your home country you would hope that, you know, your home country wins, you know, in that type of sense, especially getting all the way to the gold match. But, uh, they, they definitely did not pull away from, uh, the U S men's either. They kept coming back until the last second. Uh, but, you know, it's got to be a winner. It's got to be a loser. But I, 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 as far as, you know, the Olympics are always a good thing to kind of get away, like to watch a lot of sports that you don't really necessarily get to watch. You know, I, my wife likes watching the, uh, the swimming, the gymnastics and everything. So it, it's cool because, you know, you watch that and you, you, you think – how many of these athletes take so much time and sacrifice to get to those levels? It's just insane. Cause I mean, we have, I have a buddy like his girlfriend, I think qualified for Tokyo, but didn't actually make it all the way to the actual matches, but she got qualified to go out to Tokyo. But he, I heard when you go out, even you have to qualify to go to the Olympics. And then when you get to the Olympics, you also have to qualify as you have to do a, some more qualifying things in there too so you're just battling up until like the last minute yeah Um, and there are a couple of other things that i really want to get into but um let's pick up with it next time i'm not i'm not i'm not saying let's wrap it up now specifically i do want to give a shout out to grant fisher um the men's ten thousand meter final was mm-hmm. the first thing that Cheyenne and I got to catch. Uh, and again, we didn't get to catch much of it, uh, much of the Olympics at all, but we got to watch that and they went 26 laps. I think it was. Yeah. Um, uh, those marathon runners are a thing to watch. Cause it's like, you're just in a autopilot running mode. Yeah. But it's, that. it's, it's a, it's a mindset too, right? Yes. I, I'm, I'm going to come back to that in a second. So Grant Fisher from, the U S won the bronze medal for the men's 10,000 and the men's 5,000 meter. Mm-hmm. Um, so shout out to him. And by the way, the overall Olympics, um, medals, which I, I looked up yesterday. Let me, let me see. Yeah, I never saw the final count, the final count. Um, USA 40 golds, uh, and China 40 golds, but, the U S had a total of 126 medals and China had 91 medals. And then Japan came in third with 20 medals and then everybody else was underneath them. So when we talk about America being known for, so the U S was number one in, in the medals, uh, like overall medals received was the U S and we tied, we tied China with the uh, most golds uh, being Mm. at 40 gold medals. So when we talk about America uh, and our obesity rate, Check this out. Um, <laughs> We're winners. That's all good. <laughs> yeah. And, and, we and win. I mean, but that's the thing is you have so many dedicated athletes here. Um, and I think it, it does come with a lot of the history of the, of the country, which I'm totally not going to get into. Okay. <laughs> um, but we were, you know, pursued to be the land of the free. And I think with a lot of the freedoms that we have, people realize we have the freedom to choose what we want to do with our lives. And these literally kids that train, these kids are training because these athletes that go to the Olympics and are accomplishing these things, they're not our age by any means. 
there was a 16 year old that was running in those track and fields in those realize I was like, Jesus Christ. I mean, 16 years old break dance breaking in made its debut in the Olympics. So this, it, it's huge for us in the dance community. Okay. Yes. Um, so there was a 16 year old in that as well. And he battled, mm. uh, he battled a 34 year old in his first round. Um, and, it, and it was just a, again, they, like the commentator was like, this is a battle of youth versus experience here. Right. So fun to watch. I got to catch, I think maybe 10 of the like qualifying rounds before I had to leave. Uh, that was Saturday when they were on. Mm-hmm. Um, but Victor from the U S uh, scored the bronze medal for breaking, which is so cool because the U S is where the hip hop industry and breaking was born. So, mm-hmm. um, but again, like you said, there's so many rounds to qualify going in. So when they had to determine like the battle rounds, there were 16 seeds and the first seed was from Japan. Uh, mm-hmm. his, his name was Shiga kicks who I've seen, uh, not in person, but, um, online before. And I'm like, uh-huh. Oh my God, this guy's a beast. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. So then when I sat down and, and turned it on, I was like, okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Um, I saw Shiga kicks and I was like, Oh my God, this guy's going to win everything. <laughs> and then I saw one of my favorite breakers from like when I really started getting into breaking, which was, I guess when YouTube really like started broadening, like it's content back yeah. in 2008, um, and I really was like, I had my eyes open to the whole world of like Rebel BC one, which was like one of the biggest breaking competitions in the world. Um, Hong Ten from Korea had won that competition like three times, which he's, I think one of only two or three in the last 25 years to have done it. He was in the Olympics. Um, so I was like, oh, this guy's going to shut it down. But Hong Ten's 38 years old now. Um, so imagine him, you know, 18 years ago, he was 20 years old. He was a young buck in the game, like doing crazy stuff. But uh, back to the mentality of like the long distance runners, it's it's a mindset because you're like, oh, they're just an autopilot. I watched a lot of guys in the last couple of laps of those mm-hmm. of, of those races where they're just like, you yeah, know, I've just been waiting for this. And they're just like, yeah, <laughs> see yep. ya. It is, uh, and again, just from being in the environment of track and field, and one of our, you know, friends we know, I'll say his name after the pod, but he was a distance runner, and he knew when to, like, to take off, and just seeing that moment that, because I knew, I'm like, watch, wait, that he's, he's, like, in second or third right now, bet money he hits first, because I know he's going to hit that gas, seeing that is I, it's speechless. I, I don't even know how he does it, but he will just be in behind those second or third guys. And you just think he's out of gas and then just a moment. And he's like, and did, goes right around. And he just, did this person graduate? Did this person graduate a year before we did? No, he graduated with us. Okay. But I, uh, but there was another one that uh, he did uh, graduate a year before us. I'm not sure if you know him, but if is maybe. But he was another guy that was in, uh, in the track. He's the guy I'm thinking of because I'm pretty sure I was in gym class with him and was jogging around my first lap, and he completed the mile already. Right? <laughs> like it was yeah. just, it, and it wasn't. It didn't look like he was running fast. His yeah. tr- his strides were just insane. Right. It, like just insane. And, and that's the thing. Like when we we're in practice, when we did the mile, you know, they would like tell us like, Hey, you better be getting a good mile because if not, you're going to be running more in practice. So that was more intent for us to get a good mile back then. But I, uh, yeah, it was just insane. The just when, when you seen those athletes and then in those final laps, just seeing them turn on that second and third gear, just start getting faster and faster. And then that last 200 is like when they just exhaust everything yeah so the mindset just back to the breaking real quick because they had like with the breaking they're only 
they're breaking, they're dancing for a minute at a time right. back and forth. And in all of the pre-qualifier rounds, there were, um, each dancer only got two rounds as they were battling. But then when they got to the elimination rounds, it was three rounds. Mm. And <clears throat> again, they said early on, um, because you didn't see a lot of intense stuff early on because they had to go through so many rounds. I don't know how many rounds specifically, but I'll like, I'll follow up with that next week when we talk about this a little bit more in depth. Yeah. Um, but I did happen to watch the semifinal round that determined the bronze medal winner and Shiga kicks who was the first seed coming into all of it from Japan. Well, I was like, Oh, this guy's going to shut it down. He was in the semifinal round with Victor from the U.S. And Victor kept looking at the judges while he was doing, you know, doing his stuff. And he's just like, this guy's repeating. He's doing stuff over and over again. So the mindset is you got to save your best stuff yeah. as far as you can. Like there's a there's definitely a mentality behind it. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how the breaking looks in four years from now. 